This is a cross-cultural conversation. I'm going to begin with a bit just about that. Um, one reason this field didn't exist for a long time is because doctors are in their cubby holes and uh, evolutionary biologists in theirs, and they try to defend their turf pretty well. Um, most evolutionary biologists, on hearing that doctors are interested, immediately say, you guys don't know about your evolutionary biology. Go mind your own business. Um, actually, that's not quite true. Some say that, but enough to create a boundary uh, between. Many of us have been marvelously benefited from the generosity of evolutionary biologists who have helped us, even though we don't know as much as we'd like to, to apply some of these ideas. And on the other side, many physicians are increasingly recognizing there's a lot of really interesting science that even if we don't quite know how to apply it yet, is just so insanely cool that not to be interested is just to be brain dead. We're calling the topic today Envisioning the Opportunities, and my goal here is to hear from a lot of you about how you can envision the future for this field. Some of us, I think myself included, have a somewhat narrow view, and that should be expanded by the end of today. Our goal, how to avoid natural selection, um, if we possibly can. So we're 153 years after publication of The Origin of Species, and the canyon between evolution and medicine is at least as deep as the Grand Canyon. There are small bridges across. There are studies of infectious disease and phylogeny and genetics, but they're very slim bridges indeed. Evolution in three slides. Let's see if we can do it. Um, selection is not a theory, actually. It's a principle, a principle that must be true. Whenever individuals vary on a trait that influences survival and reproduction, not necessarily organisms, but the glasses in your cupboard, for instance, and that variation is transmitted, then the group will change over time. This must be true. Many of you take your coins um, and you put them in a jar every evening. And then the next morning, do you take out a random sample of those coins? You don't. As a result, the jar goes from that to that. This is selection. If you want to understand why your penny jar is a penny jar and not a coin jar, the answer is selection. If you want to understand why the group here is the group here, it's selection. If you want to, you're a very subset of the people in the Bay Area. If you want to understand why what's on television is on television, it's because the producers throw anything they possibly can up there and we watch some of it. And it's really disturbing, isn't it, to think that the grandest psychological experiment of all time is television, to see what we will watch, and the result is just so, says such bad things about our species. Natural selection, Darwin watched pigeons. He was fascinated by pigeons and wrote to many fanciers around the UK saying, do you think they all come from the same stock or do they come from different species in the first place? This was a profound question of its time. And he very quickly started to de decide that the fantail and the puffer and the big ones and the little ones and that they all might have come from the same stock. And if that was true, just because of pigeon breeding, maybe different species came from the same stock originally. How does selection actually work? When we teach it, we always show these diagrams of different species becoming different species, but that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is to look at variation within a species. These are all honey creepers and their different beaks. The one in the middle can get its beak into the flower. Some of them have beaks too long, too short, too curved, too straight. The rest don't work. And natural selection is acting constantly, not to change things, but to keep things the same. Because those birds that have beaks that are too outside the mean lose their ability to get nectar and don't do as well. Here's something Darwin observed, a Madagascar orchid and Gracium sesquipedale, which had a spur 30 centimeters long. He looked at that and he said, there's got to be a reason for it. In fact, because it's white, I think that there's probably a moth that probably reaches down to the bottom of that spur. And other scientists went looking and they said, Darwin, good try, but this time you're wrong. Uh, no such thing. We can't find any moth that does it. It just has that spur. After Darwin died, however, someone went back again and discovered Xanthopan morgani predicti, because the existence of this moth had been predicted uh, by Darwin based on the observation of that flower. These are the people who have inspired this field. Most of all, the tall man, George C. Williams, has been my friend and colleague for many years, and I miss him so dearly. He died two years ago. 
Uh, Aaron Smyer was the fellow who inspired me with his book, The Growth of Biological Thought, a thick book which says a lot about Aaron Smyer inventing most everything, but at the core of it, he talks about there being two threads of biology, one about how things work and the other about why things are the way they are and the importance of both kinds of biology. John Maynard Smith, another dear friend recently passed away who inspired many of us applying game theory and deep thinking to every area of evolution. And finally, Nico Tinbergen, who emphasized that there are four different questions we need to answer in biology. This is where I really feel my biology education got going, and I wish it had been before medical school instead of after. There are two kinds of questions we need to answer. One, proximate ones, how does it work? The other, evolutionary ones, about how did it get that way? These are separate questions, not alternatives. Most important single distinction in biology, in my opinion. And Ernst Meyer says it clearly in his book. He says that no biological problem is solved until both the proximate and the evolutionary causation has been elucidated. Furthermore, the study of evolutionary causes is as legitimate a part of biology as is the study of the usually physical chemical proximate causes. I read that and I thought, oh my god. I'm a doctor and I've only been using one half of biology. In fact, all of medical research has only been using one half of biology. We have a lot of work to do. It also became clear to me about that time that there was something mysterious I was observing. My first years of medical school, I was just in awe of the body. The, the nephron, I mean, oh my god, it's so incredible, the nephron. Or the mitral valve, to say nothing of the mind and the eye and all the usual examples, fabulous. And then you get to the clinic and you realize you don't have to be a doctor to design a better body. Uh, the first thing you do is eliminate the appendix. Um, why bother? In fact, astronauts often have the appendix removed. Then you'd certainly take out the wisdom teeth. Uh, you can do without those just fine. I'm sure many of us are doing just fine without those. Um, turn the eye inside out. Would you design a camera with a blind spot, with the wires running between the light and the re receptors? You wouldn't. You'd make the bones stronger so they don't break. You would increase, improve the immune system so that you don't have as many infections. You would certainly make the blood clot more slowly. And in the great boon to women that has, women have wanted all the years, you would actually install a zipper um, so that babies could be born much more sensibly instead of going through a narrow, painful rim of bone. There's so many things in the body that are just senseless. Why is that? Why isn't the body better? Parts of the body are exquisite. The eye is always used as an example. But if you think two seconds about it, you realize other parts are botched. And the best example of that is also the eye, with cataracts and glaucoma and detached retinas and a blind spot and all the rest. Why did natural selection screw up so badly in this design? So evolutionary explanations for disease is where George Williams and I started. And we talked for six months about why is, why is there cancer? Why is there Alzheimer's disease? Why is there atherosclerosis? Turns out to be the wrong question. My students still ask it. And I've got to beat it out of them the first few weeks of the term. The right question is, why has natural selection left the body vulnerable to disease? We're not trying to explain diseases directly. We're trying to explain traits that leave us vulnerable to disease. That's a very good question. So emphasizing. Disease is not shaped by natural selection. Um, and half of the papers in evolutionary medicine that claim to be are trying to explain the evolution of colorblindness or something. And let me tell you, they're nonsensical, most of them, because they're, they're trying to, these things have not been shaped by natural selection. Vulnerability to disease has been, and this turns out to be quite a new perspective. Turns out evolution can help us explain why things don't work as well as why they do work. And that's opened up a whole new area. So there are three research questions in medicine. The old one before we really had science is, what causes it? Why do some people get sick? Is it a miasma? Is it, what, what, what causes one person to get sick while another doesn't? Scientific research, which is exemplified in all other research buildings within half a mile of here, is how does a mechanism work? That's the vast majority of medical research, and it's offering us great benefits. It's fabulous. We're getting there. But a third question that's been neglected is, why isn't the mechanism better? And every single disease needs an extra paragraph in our textbooks of medicine saying, why didn't natural selection adjust things so that we were less vulnerable to this disease? This is an evolutionary explanation. So what is evolutionary medicine? It's not a method of practice at all. If you find a doctor who says, I practice evolutionary medicine, run. It's not radical in any way or opposed to the rest of medicine in any way. It's just 
applying a basic science to, to medicine, one that's been badly neglected. Um, it's just like genetic medicine, except the basic science is evolutionary biology instead of genetics. Um, this is the paper that David mentioned, that George and I wrote. I, didn't, I thought the dawn of Darwinian medicine was a much too grand title, but he insisted, and he got his way on this one, and probably he was right, you know? Uh, 20 years later, Science wrote an article about Darwinian medicine's drawn-out dawn, and this is a topic for all of you. Why has it taken 20 years? Is it just it takes that long, or is it that those of us in the field really don't know how to go about growing it faster? These are some of the new books in the area. This is the one that George and I wrote. Um, the two on the right-hand side are edited volumes, and the what's wonderful is that's out in the second edition from Oxford, that's out in the second edition from Oxford. That's a new textbook came out three years ago, and that's a book of Deutsch. It's coming along very quickly now in publications. A group of us were invited to spend a year in Berlin working on how to develop the field of evolutionary medicine without the kind of expertise that's in this room. One idea we came up with was creating a journal online called the Evolution of Medicine Review. That's the main information source for the field now. And if you want to catch up with what's going on, just go there. Every paper and every conference is listed there so you can keep up with the field. Uh, the World Health Summit was focused on the evolution of medicine a year ago. A uh, special issue of PNAS on the topic a summer course that we run. If any of you are seriously interested, or even just desperately interested, um, come join us for this course. We have one or two more slots available for this course on evolution, infection, and cancer this summer. It's in Arcadia National Park. And there's a brand new foundation that was just uh, incorporated in Connecticut last week. It's my job to be president of that foundation, and we're going to be sponsoring a journal called Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health, one of two new journals that we'll start publishing next year. The other is called Evolutionary Medicine. Steve Stearns is going to be the editor of this journal. Many of the members of the editorial, in fact, I think maybe most of the speakers today are members of the editorial board. So that's what we have accomplished, but if you look at it in the right perspective, it's not very much, really, compared with what's needed. Um, we're creating new educational materials through a group at National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, but there are no courses in medical schools at all. If you ask students at Stanford Medical School, does find the difference between approximate and evolutionary explanation, 80% of them will say, what are you talking about? Never heard of that before. If you ask them, what about kin selection? Most of them will say, gosh, I've never heard about that before. Things that are covered in the first month of any evolutionary biology course. No evolutionary biologists on medical faculties. Uh, just not there to even offer advice about what we should be doing. There are no research institutes, no research funding, not from the United States government to speak of. On specialized topics, you can get it. But to really answer these questions in large scale, we have found no way uh, to engage research funding to pro do the proper studies. And a scientific society is not yet organized. So we are really all together on the ground floor. Quickly, why aren't bodies better? Six answers. The old answer is natural selection just is too random and weak to make it better. The new answer is that there are six good reasons, which George and I spent a couple of years trying to figure out how best to you know, codify these. They are mismatch with the modern environment, competition with things that evolve faster than we do, every trade is a trade-off so nothing can be perfect, constraints on what natural selection can do, Organisms, in fact, are shaped for reproduction, not for health. And finally, there are a lot of defenses like fever, pain, and nausea that aren't diseases at all. They're actually useful responses. I'm going to give you one or two examples of each of these just to help you get in the spirit of asking these kinds of questions. I'm not going to claim to prove the point for any of them. Mismatch, our bodies are ill-suited for our modern environments. Here's a recent article from New England Journal showing infectious disease plummeting just in the last 50 years, while multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, diabetes, and asthma are skyrocketing upwards. And here is Crohn's disease, a disease that's become vastly more common in modern times just the last 50 years, and inflammation of the small bowel, fatal in many instances. And here's a very brave doctor who decided that maybe it was the lack of worms in our guts that was making us vulnerable because worms usually downregulate the immune response, and in fact, we've had them in our guts for the past many millions of years. Living without worms in your gut is a very abnormal thing that we all do now. So he gave them worms and found response rates of almost 60%, remissions. 
Multiple sclerosis is one of the more dramatic ones. This is a study in South America. A uh, group of patients who did and didn't have worms in their gut with multiple sclerosis clearly diagnosed. The ones who did have worms in their gut had, um, I'll do it this way, these are the people who did not have worms in their gut and they wanted a terrible progression of their multiple sclerosis. These are the people who did not have worms in their gut. Hardly any of them progressed to terrible multiple sclerosis. Fabulous ideas here. There's a frightening slide for all of us. Uh, this stuff is in the coronary arteries of most of us. And it's a terrible thing that we're trying to avoid with medicines and all the rest, almost, only modestly successfully. Your doctor will say, keep your levels of cholesterol below 200 and you're likely to have a heart attack anyhow. What's going on? One of the answers comes from looking at cross-culturally at what cholesterol levels are for people who are living in more natural environments. They're more like 120 or 130. Breast cancer, can you believe it's, it's 10 times more common now than it used to be? Why is that? Part of it is because the number of menstrual cycles for modern women is, is um, four times as many, at least. Another interesting angle there's no time to talk about is that exposure to light at night inhibits melatonin secretion, and melatonin has been shown in wonderful mouse studies to decrease the division of cells in the breast that are prone to cancer. Nearsightedness is one of the things that preoccupied me all through medical school. It's a heritable disease. The variation in nearsightedness is almost entirely genetic, so why didn't natural selection eliminate those genes? I asked my professor that, and he said, Nessie, you've got to get used to it. Natural selection just can't do a lot of things. And I said, so I'm on this African savanna, and I'm saying, hello, kitty. Um, no, that just doesn't make any sense at all. It turns out that it's not a genetic defect, that if you don't read early in life and you have a normal ancestral diet, you will not get nearsightedness no matter what genes you have. This is what we should te be teaching our students. Everything is genuinely gene-environment interaction. Something, something can be 100% genetic and 100% environmental at the same time. And here's one for you. Um, diabetes type 1 genes turn out to be more frequent in Northern Europe than Southern Europe. And there are many animals that have high levels of glucose in their tissues to protect their cells from ice damage when they freeze in the winter. And one author decided that this was the explanation for type 1 diabetes genes. It was the Ice Age. Yeah. So an editor of a major publication called me and said, Dr. Nessie, what do you think? The evolutionary explanation for diabetes has been discovered. And I said, are you kidding me? Uh, diabetes type 1 is an autoimmune disease. It kills off beta cells and you die, which hurts your reproductive success quite a lot. That's nonsensical at all. What are you talking about? Don't, don't publish that. I got a note a few weeks later saying, Dr. Nessie, we respect your opinion um, to ask experts about this, um, but we've asked the three leading diabetes experts in the world about this, and they all say it's probably correct. And I replied saying, no, I didn't say ask diabetes experts. I said ask evolutionary biologists. As a result, I now have to go around the world and you know, there are all these ideas that really smart, scientifically informed people can't judge very well because it's intrinsically hard and because they don't know how to do it. So this is really hard science. This is not something for amateurs to make up things and, and pass them around. I've written an article called 10 Questions to Ask About Evolutionary Studies of Disease to Immunize Students and Other People Against Making the Obvious Mistakes. If you can get past those 10 questions, you've got a running start. Coming up, about mismatch, uh, Bill Leonard is going to be talking about diet and Steve Hayes on healthy behavior. I look forward to their talks. Every one of the things I'm talking about is going to be expanded by people who study the specifics. Second reason why bodies aren't better is competition with other pathogens. They evolve faster than we do. Antibiotic resistance is increasing as fast as we can make new antibiotics. We need a new approach to this. What we're doing isn't working at all, and doctors almost always use the word emergence in their literature instead of even using the word evolution. The word evolution is used less than 10% of the time to describe antibiotic resistance. I don't know what's wrong with doctors not using proper scientific words about this, but there's something missing. Uh, Carl Bergstrom is a friend of mine who's a mathematical biologist and he does wonderful work. One of the, this paper is analyzing some, again, well-meaning physicians who decided that they'd decrease antibiotic resistance in their hospital by giving a different main first choice antibiotic for six months, then they'd all agree and use another one the next six months and another one the next six months to prevent antibiotic resistance. 
But again, even these evolutionarily inclined doctors didn't do the math. Carl did the math, and what these doctors were doing was creating multi-drug resistance very, very quickly. This is one of my favorite new ones. Turns out that about 15% of the sugars in milk are not digestible by the baby. That's like the long spur that I showed you from that flower. Something odd is going on here. Turns out that even though the baby can't digest them, there's something else that can't digest them, pathogenic bacteria. What can digest them is bifido, the bacteria that originally colonized the gut and that you want in there. Furthermore, bifido are preferentially concentrated, apparently, in the milk ducts of the mother in the first days of life. Isn't that a great system? You get the bacteria where they're needed with some stuff that only they can digest and give them a head start. Fabulous. Coming up out about infection, Andrew Reid talking about evolution-proof antibiotics. Every trade is a trade-off. Nothing in the body is perfect. Please don't take that misimpression away from this talk. Um, though these bones break always in the same place when you fall forwards. Why? Because if they were thicker, you couldn't do this. Um, it'd be nice to have bones that didn't break, but at a huge cost. Likewise, it'd be nice to do away with bilirubin because it's a toxin, a uh, breakdown product from heme, and all of us in medicine memorize these pathways. But the question is, why do we use energy to take something that's water-soluble and can be excreted to make it into bilirubin, which is not water-soluble and is toxic? Turns out it's a pretty good antioxidant. So can you test these ideas, or are they just so stories? You can test them. In this case, Charles Schneider and his group knocked out um, the gene that makes that cycle go around, and cells die quite quickly from oxidative damage. Amyloid beta, of course, is the substance that's around nerves in Alzheimer's disease, and Lilly Corporation put in several hundred million dollars trying to find, uh, test a substance that interferes with the synthesis of beta amyloid. And partway through that study, they broke the blind to see how they were doing and found out, oh boy, it makes people decline faster, not slower. A huge disappointment. It turns out, out, at the same time, Socia et al. Uh, came out with a study showing that beta amyloid is a very good antimicrobial. And they did it again. They reverse synthesized the sequence and found out that the reverse sequence is not an antimicrobial. There's something very interesting going on here. I don't know what it is, uh, but something deeper about, we need to know why beta amyloid is there, not just that it's bad stuff. Coming up about trade-offs, Bernie Crespi is going to be talking about schizophrenia and autism. Constraints. A lot of things natural selection just can't do. Mutations happen. We can't start over. Our eye is inside out. The octopus has an eye that's not inside out. Doesn't have a blind spot. Bad luck for us. Can't go back. You can't have, you know, 10,000 blind generations to switch it back again. Cancer is another example, and we have two speakers who have just come in the door. I'm glad to see Athena Ekeptis and Carla Malley uh, from UCSF. Um, they're going to be talking about why on earth we can't have natural selection totally eliminating cancer. Not possible. If you're going to repair tissues, you need things to be capable of having cells that divide. And this is an article Mel Greaves and Carla Malley recently published. Um, looking specifically on applications of how we can understand selection within a tumor. And even though I talked about this for years in a recent conversation with Carlo, he, he said something like, well, you know, only 1% of the cells in a tumor survive after they divide from the main tumor. And even though I'd been thinking about this for years, it had never quite dawned on me that there's such strong selection that 99% of those cells get wiped out. And this means we need to be thinking about the environment in which those cells go into to make it inhospitable towards new cancer cells. Uh, Bernie Crespi is also going to be talking about constraints in his talk about schizophrenia. Fifth, health is not the goal of natural selection. Reproduction is. Selection maximizes reproductive success. If you have a new mutation that increases the number of children you have, it makes you live a shorter time, what will happen to that mutation? It will spread. This is really a discouraging thing, isn't it? I, I used to like to think that natural selection would make us healthy, long-lived, happy, cooperative, and uh, it doesn't do that, unfortunately. Uh, it makes us compete in ways that are bad for the ecosystem and reproduce maximally. It also made me work on aging and the feeble sex. Williams in 57 wrote the paper that inspired all of my work about why natural selection leaves us with aging. What happens to a gene that kills everybody by 120 but gives a selective advantage earlier in life? Got selected for. 
And in fact, if you look at the current dist age distribution of people, everybody's dead by age 100. But if you had the mortality rate stay the same throughout the entire lifetime as it is at age 20, about a third of us would live to age 1,000. Be kind of nice. Uh, and we'll hear later about how we can move a little bit towards that. As for the vulnerable sex, I presume you know who you are. If you visit your elderly parents in a nursing home and sit down at lunch, you were sitting down mainly to a lunch with women uh, because we men go faster. Why? Is it just in modern societies? Uh, when I asked this question and tried to find the number, I couldn't find the number I wanted. Seven years younger, we die on the average. But what I did find is a World Health Organization database that gives mortality rates by age, by sex, by country, and even by decades going back 150 years. And Dan Kruger and I have published a couple of papers on this. This is the result for 20 countries showing that for every 100 men who die in, the United, in, in these countries, 150 women die between the ages of 0 and 10. By the time you get to puberty, it's 300 women, women, 300 men die for every 100 women who die. Isn't that something? that men die three times faster than women in all of these countries. We've done further studies looking at these differences between countries, and they're evolutionarily interesting as well. Coming about, about aging, one of the world's experts, Steve Osted, telling us the latest about an evolutionary view of aging. Finally, last explanation for why our bodies aren't better is not really why our bodies aren't better, it's just doctors' misunderstanding. Most of the problems people bring to physicians are not diseases. They are symptoms like pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, and all the rest. Um, they're very different from defects in the body, like paralysis, seizures, jaundice, injury, and cancer. Two really different kinds of things. Doctors intuitively know this, but they don't always get it right. So what would it be like to not have a defense? How about living without pain? Doesn't that sound great? Except that people who are born with no capacity for pain are almost always dead by their mid-30s. Not so good, actually. Um, so how does selection shape mechanisms that regulate defense? I got very serious about this. I thought, oh my god, I'm a doctor, and what I'm doing with my life is blocking normal defenses. Am I hurting people? How can I analyze this? And the right way to analyze this is with signal detection theory. And you essentially look at the costs and benefits of expressing or not expressing a response in the face of the probability that the danger is actually present. I'll skip that, but the, you can actually plug numbers in here quite easily about the signal to noise ratio and the prevalence of the danger in that environment and the cost and benefit of the response. Let's make it concrete. Um, you hear a little noise behind a rock at an African watering hole. And it's about like this. It's not loud enough to be a lion. It could be a monkey. It could be some monkey burping or something. Do you run home, or do you go and get water for your family after all? How do you calculate it? Well, it depends on how often lions have been spotted in the area, and the costs of fleeing, 200 calories, we'll say, and the cost of not fleeing if there's a lion there. That's 200,000 calories. So how can you do the calculation? This one's very simple, actually. It means that you should flee whenever the noise behind that rock is loud enough to indicate that there's a greater than 1 in 1,000 chance that a lion is behind that rock. This means that 999 times out of 1,000, running away and having a fight, flight, response, and panic attack will be perfectly normal, but utterly unnecessary. This changed my practice of psychiatry and treating people with panic disorder. They kept going to the grocery stores and having panic attacks. I said, hey, listen, you've been in that grocery store 10 times. You know it's safe. And they said, yeah, doctor, but I keep having panic attacks. <laughs> now I finally understood why they kept having panic attacks. The mechanism is designed to go off whenever the net benefit in the long run is positive. We call this the smoke detector principle, and I think it's one of the more useful clinical applications of evolutionary biology and medicine. We put up with smoke detectors because we tolerate the false alarms in order to get the benefits of it going off every single time there's a fire. This is why the general practice of medicine is possible safely. This is what general physicians do mostly, is block normal defensive reactions to relieve suffering, and it's a good thing. But you've got to watch out for that one time in a thousand when you shouldn't have blocked your defensive response. Doctors know this also. Coming up about defenses, uh, June and his colleagues are going to be talking about how defenses are altered by medications. So why isn't the body better? Six good evolutionary reasons. Mismatch, 
uh, infection, trade-offs, constraints, selections for reproduction, not health, and the smoke detector principle. Conclusions, traits that leave us vulnerable to disease need evolutionary explanation. Again, not diseases, but traits that leave us vulnerable to diseases. Evolution also offers much more. What I've been telling you today is the work that George Williams and I developed, but there are all these other areas of evolutionary application medicine which are also profoundly useful, such as phylogenetic methods for tracing pathogen evolution, and broader than that, just a feeling for the organism. It's not a machine. It's nothing like a machine, really. It's something very different. And even those who are doing whole genome studies now still often seem to have the idea that we're going to find the gene for something, but the more you get into it, most genes are for many, many different things. Three cautions. Uh, the first is that evolution does not tell doctors what to do and should not. Evolution tells you what research to do. That's why it's at least as useful for public health as it is for medicine. Then, many evolutionary hypotheses are wrong, just as they are in every other area of science. And the methods we use for figuring out which are right or wrong are in, unfamiliar to many physicians, and it's very hard scientific work. I'm very worried about this field being run away by people who really don't know what they're doing. I think we need to be appropriately critical for every one of these. It's a difficult area of science. Bottom line, uh, evolution is a basic science that's only now being applied to medicine, and those of us who are trying to do it would greatly appreciate some help to figure out how we can do it better, how we can spread the word, and how we can encourage really rigorous research, which I'm pretty sure will actually improve human health. I, mean, I got into this just because I found it so fascinating. But the further I go and the more I listen to people like my colleagues who are going to be giving the subsequent talks, I realize that this is actually very serious business that can be enormously beneficial for human health, and we're just getting started. I'd like your comments about how we can let doctors know about the opportunities, how can we develop a social network that encourages enthusiasm along with appropriate criticism for good science, and basically, what can we do to better develop the field? More information at my website, and my hope is that these bridges will grow broader very quickly. Thanks very much. Amy Samuels from Versant Ventures. I, I have a basic question that I struggle with. For women over the age of 45, presumably post-reproductive, are they living a post-selection life? And, and what are the evolutionary pressures on them? Great question. There's a slide I left out, actually, about all the Nobel Prize winning scientists I heard on panels um, across the world in the, in the great Darwin year of, of 2009. And one of them, actually two or three times I heard people say, gosh, um, seems to me that nothing matters after menopause. But kin selection means that you have the same genes as your children. And if you do something at age 70 that increases your child's risk of, uh, of death or your child's likelihood of survival, you are doing things that increase the likelihood that your own genes will go on to the next generation. So kin selection explains why you can do things after menopause that still benefit your genes. As for the reason for their menopause at all, at all it turns out not to be just things falling apart. Uh, very few organisms have menopause. The vast majority are very pro-social mammals, uh, humans and right whales and, and a few others. And it's a very good issue that George Williams put in his 1957 paper about why menopause exists. Great arguments, no resolution of that question yet. Wonderful question. Um, but given that women are living so much longer, will there be selective pressure for a prolonged optimal fertility window uh, over time? Yes, there will. And Steve Osted will be talking about that. These experiments have been done, actually, in mice and in uh, flower beetles and in flies. And I presume the same thing's happening in humans, but it'll probably take not just a few thousand years, but a few tens of thousands of years. Uh, but he'll have a better idea. Do you want to address that now? First? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. There have been experiments, mainly in flies, where they've uh, basically pushed back the age of reproduction and, and, and longer life follows. But there's this difference. In those cases, uh, they pushed it back from the time where most flies were already dead. That's not what's happening with human reproduction. It's not that people, uh, so, so it, the dynamics aren't clear. Just because um, 
um, we're not, you know, we're not pushing it back. We, we already, by the time we finish reproducing, almost everybody's still alive. And that's different than the way they did it in flies. So there's actually some interesting mathematical modeling to be done to answer this question finally. So it makes your point perfectly, which is sometimes your intuition can mislead you. You need to do the math. And along those lines further, a lot of people are trying to decide now whether to take hormones to make their hormone profile more like it is in early adulthood instead of in later life. All kinds of men are taking testosterone in order to you know, make their body more like, is that smart? It's very uncertain whether that's smart or not because there may be good evolutionary reasons why testosterone has, is ramped down in later life and you might be fussing with things that screw everything up uh, by ramping it up a, to a supposedly normal level. If you have evolutionary thinking about what's normal, you take a very different view of these kinds of things. One or two more and then move on. I'm fascinated by your description that the word emergence is in all the medical journals, although it is evolution of the bacteria. Do you think there's a political oversight to that that's making the editors and the researchers use the word emergence when it actually should be evolution? You know, that question was not asked, and, and you don't necessarily get honest answers when you ask that question, do you? Uh, I've talked, have opportunity to talk with lots of deans about evolution in their medical curriculum, and most of them say, no, it doesn't bother me at all. But then we did have this one really big donor who's a conservative, you know, evangelical, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to offend anybody unnecessarily. Uh, so that issue is there. I think it, very few doctors have ever had a course in evolutionary biology, very few. And even, even those who have had a course often have a course that mainly talks about phylogeny and, and, and population genetics. The kind of things we're talking about here, about trade-offs in life, history traits, and trying to understand reproductive success at the cost of health and all these kind of things, we're really going to need to create new educational materials to get these core principles of evolutionary biology into medical doctors' minds. And I think it'll have to happen at the undergraduate level mostly. There's not much time in medical school. But we're trying our best to see what we can do about medical schools as well. I was uh, several years ago now, I was at a symposium um, and the Society for Prevention Science, which is the public health dimension of this, a whole symposium on prevention science from an evolutionary perspective. That was attended by two grants officers from NIH and NIDA, I think, who were sitting in to see if this was a kind of a uh, area to uh, invest in. After the day, uh, we approached them and we asked them, you know, was this, you know, is this the kind of thing that you might fund? And they said, well, it's really interesting, but they advised not using the word evolution because it was so unfamiliar. And it's really more a matter of conservatism than bias, I think. I think that uh, these are, this is a population which is not opposed to evolution in any way at all, but it's also conservative. And it's out of the box, uh, even to use the word. I think that might be part of the, part of the answer. Along those lines, if I might add, sort of following up on, on Randy's point about catching students during the undergraduate years. This is critically important. By the time they reach medical school, it's in some sense too late. And yet I think from my own experience at Northwestern with our program in human biology, the program here at Stanford in human biology, there is a tremendous level of interest and enthusiasm about these kinds of issues as they apply to the human condition. And so weaving evolution into the context of understanding human variation and human biology, I think is something that has the potential for great growth in the undergraduate education. Across so the along those lines, I've heard that the largest major here at Stanford is human biology. Um, is there someone from that program who can speak to how much evolutionary medicine is in it? Um, we begin the human biology core with Dobzhansky's uh, expression, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. That's the first slide we show. Um, we teach evolution for the first five or six weeks of the human biology core course required of all undergraduates. Um, they read on the origin of species, parts of it, not all of it because it could kill their interest, some of it. <laughs> Um, and we use um, many disease phenomena, including sickle cell disease, uh, the evolution of adult lactose intolerance. We use all kinds of disease and health-related examples to emphasize these trade-offs, and um, it's, it's fundamental to the curriculum. We were invited to do a version of the human biology curriculum for the middle grades of the United States. 
I was asked to co-author the chapter on evolution, and we were, we had a, a draft, and we were asked to leave out the E word. And uh, so we tried using experiments with, uh, we tried using pets. Do, do I see Jeannie Scott there? Pigeons. <laughs> we, we, probably, we probably should not take excess time. I don't want to go in. Uh, um, Daniel Fisher from uh, um, uh, Stanford. I guess I'm a theoretical physicist, basically. But it, it seems to me one of the big problems with the way that evolution is taught is it's tended to be taught as a subject in which most things are understood rather than a subject in which a large number of things aren't understood. And of course, some of that is response to the uh, um, creationists and so on. Um, but it seems to me very um, problematic. And I think even the stage when we're even things like time scales for antibiotic resistance to arise, and really what the root of that is, is not understood, that uh, one has to be you know, much more honest about this and emphasize much more of that in the uh, teaching as well. Good, good. Last comment or question? Well, I'm Eugenie Scott, National Center for Science Education. Um, we deal a lot with the creationism and evolution controversy. And uh, survey research data show that evolution is hardly taught at all at the K-12 level, uh, much less, as, as Bill was saying, the organizing principle of the biological sciences. You know, things make sense. Things are like they are, like you were saying, Randy. Be, in biology because of the principle of common ancestry. That tells you why things are like they are in biology. But that's not getting communicated, and there's a large list of reasons for why that is so, which your colleagues have dealt with quite a bit. But yeah, in order to get evolutionary medicine launched, um, frankly, I think medicine is a wonderful hook for uh, getting more evolutionary biology into the uh, high school and undergraduate curriculum, because it presents evolution in a context in which um, knowledge of this science, these sciences, is very important for a very practical end. So I, I think this is a wonderful symposium, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. We'll, we'll get on to the rest. One quick comment about where we're going with all of this. National Institute of, of Health is where we should be looking, I think, for, uh, for leadership. And we have some. There's some very good people there doing evolution and infectious disease. But if you look at all the broader topics I've been talking about, they're spread all over the institutes. And there, there really isn't any federal source for bringing this all together. We're going to need, need to look elsewhere for evolution and medicine institutes created at leading universities if this is going to grow quickly.